so very lovely. Thank you, choir. It's a great song. So I tried to dodge Matthew 18 this year. I thought, oh, we're gonna run out of time. We're not gonna do it. But uh, my conscience got the better of me. And so we have to talk about forgiveness. So why am I reluctant to talk about forgiveness? I think it's because from across my life and working with you and others, I keep seeing people who have been run over by a truck of um, meanness and wrongness. And these are the ones that are struggling to forgive. And I just feel like, oh, it's so much more complicated. The topic is just so much more nuanced. There's just so much more to it. And I just, I'm just reluctant to weigh in on the topic unless I can have a chunk of time and talk about several things all at once. So hang in there and do not beat yourself up if you are struggling with forgiveness today. I, I'm a safe person. Let me mark myself as a safe person uh, to talk to. If you have feelings of unforgiveness or hate or despair around things, you know, safety. So not a simple topic. Uh, forgiveness is a gift. God wants us to heal. So that's, that's what we're headed toward, but I don't want to gloss over and act like it's easy. So forgiveness chapter 18 of Matthew. So uh, I started uh, looking, when I was analyzing 18, I started looking at this little process that, eight, that chapter 18 has in verses 15 through 17. And that little process is kind of a cornerstone for understanding mediation and legality. So it's kind of a useful text so it starts out with a scenario, say person A has done something wrong or harmful. And, step, then, and then there's person B who experienced the wrong and the harm. So A and B. Step one, person B goes to person A and says, hey, you have harmed me. You have done something wrong. And the text says, if there is listening, that's an interesting word. It's repeated throughout the process. If there is listening in person A, you have regained that one. Oh, that's great. Seems like that's the goal. Regaining, healing, oh, understanding. But if there is not regaining, you don't quit there. You go to another step of pulling in a couple more people and uh, explaining it with them. And it talks about having witnesses and having testimony. So there's evidence and facts uh, that get placed on the table about what's going on. And you might get a restoration, you might get listening, or you maybe don't. So then the process goes to another step. What happens in the next step? Did you pay attention to that? What happens? Yeah, the group, the group comes, right? They group comes and the same thing happens uh, of, okay, here's the deal, here's the facts, is there listening, is there not listening? And at that third step, if there is not listening, did you see what happened? What's that? Well, yeah, they take it to church, right, that group, yep. And if that doesn't, and then after that, what happens? If, they, if there's no listening. There's like a, a boundary or something that takes place. And I love it when we talk to the kids in our little education planning time this morning. They're like, what do you mean by boundary? And so we came up with time out. It's okay to set a boundary. And so you set a boundary there with what's going on. So with that process, okay, now this is where I'm really inviting your input on this. I think there's pluses and maybe some minuses about that process. So let's start with the pluses. So when you hear that little process, when there is a wrongful thing or a harmful thing, what's the plus side? What would you say? 
anything. There are no wrong answers. What do you think? Discussion. There, what's that? Discussion. Discussion. There's discussion. They're trying to deal with it. They're not putting their heads in the sand. Okay, what else? What are plus sides of this little process? Listening. Like Listening. Opportunities. Opportunities. On both, sides. on both sides. On both sides. What else? Plus side of this little process. Okay, it is a goal of a solution, problem solving. Yeah, a goal toward restoration of the community, not division. Any other pluses? Kept private, not big Yeah, how about that? So you start with it private. You're not trying to shame somebody. There's respect there. How about that? What else? Plus side this little process. Care. 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 Care is involved. Other thoughts? Any other plus sides of this? Spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is possible. Yeah? If you don't do it, it's like potentially festering, buried, and you just gain so much more power. Yes. So it, it empowers you to do something versus keeping silent and bur being burdened, and it festers, and it could get worse. So it gives kind of a, a nudge toward doing something about it. Other things. Okay, what's on the minus side of that process? Does anything come to mind where you're like, you know, maybe it's not great? When you, what, when you, Right. So, right. Yes. So regarding person A, if you're person B and you pull in other people, you're risking your, how you look, that you may look bad by saying something to other people. It's a risk to speak up. Okay, so that's a not great side. Keep going. Confrontation is hard. Confrontation is hard. It is just hard. Midwesterners, right? You'd rather not talk about it. We'd rather not talk about it. And sometimes, you know, least said, soonest mended. But otherwise, you're just like, mm, don't want to bring it up. So other things that are kind of on the minus side of this process. Anything come to mind? Like, what's what's not to like about this process? Right. It could increase hating on the person. It could, it could make things worse. Mm -hmm. Other things? Well, shame and division. You know? Shame and division. Yeah, that could be a part of this. So, yeah, so that's why I, I am very skeptical of simplistic platitudes about forgiveness. Um, it's much trickier and I get a little nervous. And I think in Christian community, sometimes we just gloss things over and we don't uh, value the emotional, social, and justice processes that are involved. Um, in situations. And case in point, this process, if it's not coupled with other wisdom, could be very harmful. I think it can be a little bit naive um, and way too simplistic when you expect someone who is a victim to confront an abuser. It's just not going to happen. And, you know, I just think of examples in the news this week just this week you know my heart again goes out to american uh, olympic gymnasts who were harmed uh, across years um, by a doctor you know really you know that so awful so very awful um, the other story just in the news and I'm not using their names, um, these perpetrators, uh, but I want to lift up people who had the courage to speak up. 
uh, regarding another matter, Ashley Judd, and how she and others were harmed by somebody. But, you know, people who are perpetrators are very manipulative, and a lot of times the people who are harmed have less power. So another illustration that came into my mind, and this is my one little picture I'm gonna remember, um, that, uh, let's see if I can pull it up here. You have the PowerPoint. Um, yeah, so if you were a Wilmot Red, and uh, it was 1692, so I had a chance to, I saw uh, this when I was visiting Massachusetts a couple of years ago. You know what happened to her? She was accused of being a witch. So can you see how this little process could be abused and how people who have less power get thrown under the bus? So it's very sobering, especially in religious community when we talk about these matters. You know, Puritans, you know, our reform tradition, we've gone off the rails and seriously harmed people. And, you know, when we say, you know, set that boundary, excommunication, I mean, that's, that's a harmful, terrible thing and, and what can happen to people, including death by hang, hanging. Injustice can be a part of that. So that's why I, when the topic of forgiveness comes up, I say, hold on, let's get more things on the table. Well, this time when I was studying the matter, it struck me, and this happened in Wednesday Bible study, and I kind of pulled on this thread later in the week too. A lot of times you zoom out from a text and you look at the context. And the context of all of chapter 18 gives me hope for the topic of forgiveness. So here's why. The very first verse of Matthew 18, verse 1, it's the disciples talking to Jesus, and the disciples say to Jesus, hey, who's number one in God's kingdom? Who's number one? Who does God really like? Who's the top dog in God's kingdom? And you just wonder if Jesus is kind of going, oh man, what are they thinking? He doesn't speak right away. What Jesus does is, he pulls over a child and places the child in their midst and says, unless you change and become like this child, you have no idea what God's kingdom is all about. And Jesus underscores it. I'm talking about humility. Jesus says, unless you are humble like a child, you are clueless about what God's about. And then Jesus keeps going not only be change, become humble, but you also welcome the humble, the outcast, ones without power. You read chapter 18, verses 1 through 14, and it's all about a power differential correction. In human life, in their Roman life, in human life, any times, we are all about hierarchy and who's the top dog and in God's kingdom that kind of that is just not that is to be refused in God's kingdom there is a big power correction that all are welcome and especially the humble and those powerless like a child and the rest of those verses 1 through 14 Jesus just underscores it underscores, underscores, underscores. You are to look out for the humble. You are to be humble yourself. You are to value this way to the point where if you're not practicing it, which is a good way of life, you should tear your eye out because if, it's, if you are not welcoming and embodying this way, you know, do everything you can to thwart that other way. And then also within this one through 14 verses is this little story you're like, why is that there? It's a story of the 100 sheep and one sheep goes missing. And you're thinking, why does the shepherd 
abandon all the 99 sheep and then go after that one sheep? I mean, what's going to happen to the other 99? Jesus says, this is how important it is to go after the weak, the humble, those without power. This is our value as Christian society. We look after the weak, the humble, and we are about changing up the power disparity that makes one person think they're better than somebody else. So it sets that up. That is the gold standard. Humility, looking out for those without power, valuing that, being that way yourself, and uh, applying it. So Jesus just says that so many, many, many different ways. So that's our standard. What are we upholding when we say something to person A? We are upholding humility and not harming the weak and the frail. And when that is happening, that's our standard, verses 1 through 14, humility, like a child, powerlessness. We are to be like that. We are to model that. We are to value that. When that's not happening, then we need to say something's wrong. That's the context for that process. We need to speak up. We need to walk through it. So I think that that helps me correct the potential abuse of what can happen in that process when someone with power scapegoats somebody else because that's what can happen and you know to name some other things that can happen when somebody with power and a distortion i mean it's just mentally ill to harm other people or it's it's just such a distortion to be mean and to lie and and not live with that standard. That is just wrong. But unfortunately, some people in that state have power and can convince other people. And there's this thing, I've mentioned it before, I'm mentioning it again, called DARVO, D-A-R-V-O. And it's an abusive dynamic that can happen in a, a trauma situation where someone who actually is the problem, D, denies, me, I'm not doing anything wrong. And then A accuses the person that is saying that they've done wrong. And that's what happens in these very complex situations. Someone makes an accusation, but the person denies it. And then that RVO is reverse victim, reverse victim um, offender. So I, person A, the person who's done something wrong, what? What are you saying I did something wrong? You're saying I did something wrong? I'm the victim here. You're making me look bad. How dare you speak up? And so justice is denied and the process gets derailed and we all get confused about what's going on. So, um, so just, okay, a couple of things. It's super helpful to say, well, what are our standards here? What is our covenant here? What are our values here? first before we have a process because otherwise it could get very strange so just zoom out and say we value humility we value um, looking out for those who have less power we have to correct for that a lot of times um, we also value that's in the process too what is factual um, dates telling the truth um, things like things like that so we got that standard. Um, and then this is a shout out for something else I love when you're talking about standards is covenants. You know, what is the covenant? And having a living, breathing covenant that looks out for the weak and doesn't just reinforce people who already have power and um, control. What is your covenant? Is your covenant about love uh, for all? Is your covenant about correcting social wrongs? That would be the Christian covenant idea of covenant. So that's your covenant. And then when you do a process, you can't just have a covenant. You have to have that process to keep the covenant, being accountable to these standards. So that's a covenant or standards that would be 18 verses 1 through 14, and then 15 through about is it verse 20, there's this process. Then the last chunk of the material, 
also gives us one more shot in the arm with this very complex topic of forgiveness. Peter says to, so I, first of all, I'm confused. So there's this process of accountability that leads to somebody going into timeout. And you've got to set that boundary, right? Set a boundary, tough love. And then the next material, Peter says, how often are we supposed to forgive somebody? Seven times, which sounds like a lot. And Jesus says, no, not seven times, 77 times. Okay, that makes me crazy because it sounds like you finally set a boundary. Boundaries are good, everybody. Boundaries are good. Boundaries keep people safe. Boundaries help us not spiral into getting enabled, enabling bad things, right? So it's like, oh my gosh. Does this next text say, oh, well, we should just forgive him. <laughs> oh, that makes me a little nervous. So the place I go with that next chunk of material, which talks about forgiveness, and then the last part of 18 talks about a parable of forgiveness. The last place I'll go is regarding forgiveness. Forgiveness is a gift of God. Forgiveness, you know, to err is human, to forgive divine. Forgiveness is this huge, abundant table of love. That's forgiveness, abundant table of love and hope and mercy that God just gives away. Abundant, 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 abundant forgiveness for you. So start there with this, this alternative kingdom of forgiveness for you. Dine at that table. Take that nutrient in. Thank you, thank you. So that might be helpful if we're walking through something that's very painful and we're trying to process. Picture that table of forgiveness for you. God wants you to be liberated and not bound by an unharmful dynamic. So, you know, meditate on that. Think about that abundance. Let that change you. The chapter starts with change. Let that change you. This beautiful table of love, mercy, and grace. Let that heal you. And that could be, that's usually a very independent process of whatever person A is doing. You focus on healing for yourself and uh, care for yourself and God's love for yourself. And then from that, may you be inspired to do loving acts. Don't stop being loving. Find joy. Keep doing loving things. And then what might happen in your pursuit of staying healthy, staying whole, pursuing loving things, independent of you, that other person or other people might see and be changed for themselves. Because why be mean? Why lie about it? They just don't know God's mercy. And it's just like uh, what Avery said. Why don't they confess? They're afraid. They do not know the abundance of mercy that is there. So when we live in this alternative kingdom of love, love, mercy, mercy, healing, healing, that is the truth. And I think that creates safety for people to come out of the shadows and say, oh, there is another world where I don't have to be a thief and grab power and love. There's this other world that Christians point to and it's just beyond mathematics, this, this overpowering grace. So it's tough stuff, but may you find a piece of this. God has a gift to give you in the process. God wants you to be liberated. To God be the glory.